Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming along. Do a talk at DrupalCon, they said. That's a really good idea. You can learn stuff. And then you've got to stand up here and look at all these faces. <laughs> so we're going to talk about um, uh, the Speedy Sandwich, Superfly sites with Nginx and Varnish. Uh, to introduce us, uh, this is Ollie, and I'm Joe. We work for Wunderkraut. Um, this weekend is the first time I've ever met Ollie in, pub in person. Uh, we work in different places. Ollie's in Finland. I work in, uh, in the UK. Um, we are both are developers um, and both have a, an interest in um, performance and security. Uh, with the sites that we work on, and that's hence why we're, we're, um, we're working on this, uh, presenting this talk, sorry. So here's a plan of what we're going to be talking about today, uh, this afternoon. Uh, five main things. We're going to talk about uh, Nginx itself, and uh, why Nginx is um, our go-to tool for website performance, and when you've got it, you feel good. And we're going to then talk about Varnish, uh, why Varnish is such a good uh, caching tool, and we'll do it such, so effectively that we'll be able to cope with really big traffic spikes, and we can just expect people to bring it on. And then we're going to turn to SSL and TLS, uh, getting on the good foot. Uh, in the post-Edward Snowden world, all communications should be secure always and by default, and so we need to get on the good foot. And then the fourth element we're going to talk about is Speedy itself, uh, which I guess is what most of you are most interested in. Uh, super bad, super slick Speedy. Uh, the standard response when you're talking about SSL is, of course, there's computation consequences and latency. Surely, you know, SSL at the last minute if we absolutely have to. But can we make things fast under uh, TLS itself? And that's where Speedy comes into play. And then fourthly, uh, finally, sorry, we'll get to the Speedy sandwich, which is our suggestion of a way of putting this all together to get the best of everything that we've talked about so far. And then hopefully we'll be able to show you something about the payback for that. So I'm going to hand on to Oli now, who's going to talk about um, Nginx. So hey, um, Nginx, what it can do, it's a web server, a regular proxy, static file cacher, and load balancer, mail proxy, SSL, TLS, uh, Terminator. So what we're interested here in is the web server part, the static file caching, and the SSL termination itself. Uh, as a web server, it's, it serves the static content very fast. It's light consumption. Uh, it doesn't use that much memory or hardware, other hardware resources. And it's using an event-based process model, which generally requires a lot less memory than the process-based servers like Apache. Um, and then it was originally designed as a, to be deployed alongside Apache so that the static content like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and images can be handled by Nginx. Um, over the course of the development, the ad Nginx added integration with other applications through the use of fast CGI. Uh, using it, it uses OpenSSL in, in a standard module to support SSL termination. And despite hard bleed, it's a good thing. Nginx SSL module supports um, important features to make it as fast as it can get. Uh, so there's session resumption, OSCP stapling, strict transport security. And that's basically what all that we'll be using Nginx for here. And then there's Varnish. It's a reverse proxy cache, sometimes also called an HTTP accelerator. It's focused exclusively on HTTP, so we'll have to use Nginx for the SSL termination there. And it can be used as a load balancer. It's very good at what it does, and only at what it does. There's it's a key value store. Um, it puts everything into RAM and lets the OS decide what to keep in the RAM and what to write to the disk. And that the OS has a better overview of the whole machine resources and requirements. 
and this takes away the double buff buffering issues. Um, it's designed for modern equipment. Um, for example, 64-bit multi-core machines with plenty of memory. So there's an assumption that your hardware is up to the job. Uh, that being said, it's still making an efficient use of the hardware and will, will run happily on a mediocre platform. There's no real need for bleeding edge. Do I need to say anything about that one? It's fast. <laughs> um, the advantage of using varnish can be seen in the CPU, CPU usage as well. I mean, here's a graph of a site without using varnish. Uh, the CPU usage spikes up to 100% at a few hundred concurrent users. Whereas with varnish, well, it's around 50%. And there's a lot of stuff said about varnish. So in previous Drupal cons, for example, uh, in Copenhagen 2010, Paul Henning, Henning Kump held an awesome session on Varnish, and he's the lead designer and developer of Varnish. Then SSL by Joe. <laughs> So in the good old days, we knew who was watching us, we thought, uh, and who was being watched. We thought that when the wall fell down, uh, that the watching was over, that our side, as it were, was watching the bad guys. But Edward Snowden changed all that. And now we know that what we thought were the friendly security agencies have in fact been harvesting vast amounts of data ostensibly to uh, pursue criminals and terrorists, but in the process, as we know, consuming data from everyone pretty much indiscriminately. Uh, even, as it turns out, jacking directly into the hard lines to get at the data. And over the last decade or so, we've become even more aware of the increase of cybercrime. Uh, far too few sites, um, far Far too few sites, yes, that's what I said, <laughs> uh, use SSL. I mean, you can go around the whole, pretty much, of the Amazon store, and it's not until you get to payment, pretty much, that uh, Amazon implement SSL. And so all of your browsing history is accessible if someone wants to, to really um, get into it, which, you know, it might be fine if you're looking at compilation DVDs of funny cats, but who should have the right to access that information? Um, to be part of the process of changing, you, I'm sure you know this, but Google have decided that they're going to change, well, they are changing the, um, their own um, page rank algorithm to privilege uh, HTTPS. Uh, so sites which previously, um, uh, sorry, sites with SSL will get higher rankings now than they, than they used to. And so Google are part of the kind of the social change um, they're hoping. Uh, and and uh, good for them, very important. But the big question for anyone interested in DevOps, of course, is is TLS fast yet? There was a great talk just a few months ago, back in June at the Velocity Conference by uh, Ilya Grigoric from Google. Um, I highly recommend um, viewing his, his YouTube video of his talk. And if you go to that site, uh, istlsfastyet.com, uh, there's loads of resources there, including his slides and links to uh, all kinds of really useful stuff. And what we're going to talk about here really is a summary of the, the far more detailed work that they've been, been doing there. Um, but the too long didn't read of his talk, in essence, is that uh, TLS has exactly one performance problem. Not enough sites are using it. Everything else can be optimized. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about now. We're going to try and give a, a fairly detailed view of how we can get a um, one round trip time handshake, uh, how we can go about eliminating um, latency uh, in the validation process and make TLS as fast as it can be. <coughs> the process of establishing and um, communicating over an encrypted channel introduces additional <laughs> computational costs, as you'll know. First, there's the asymmetric public key encryption, which is used during the TLS handshake itself. 
And then, once the shared secret key is established, symmetric encryption takes over. The good news is that modern hardware and um, up-to-date software have made great improvements uh, to help minimize the costs. And what once previously you would uh, assign to extra additional hardware to do the encryption work in particular uh, can now be done pretty efficiently by the CPU. Uh, two examples here, uh, Adam Langley from Google. On our production front-end machines, SSL TLS accounts for less than 1% of the CPU load, less than 10 kilobytes of memory per connection, and less than 2% of network overhead. Many people believe that SSL TLS takes a lot of CPU time, but we hope that the preceding numbers will help to dispel that. Obviously, uh, Google have the financial and p uh, human resources to put a lot of effort into that, and it's probably more advanced than most of us can hope to achieve, but certainly this is achievable. And then similarly from uh, Doug Beaver at Facebook. Uh, we've deployed TLS at a large scale using both hardware and software load balancers. We found that modern software-based TLS implementations running on commodity CPUs, standard CPUs, are fast enough to handle heavy HTTPS traffic load without needing to resort to dedicated cryptographic hardware. So this is what we're going to cover in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so. We're going to just talk about briefly what's going on at the TLS handshake stage itself. Um, where there are additional computational costs and round trip times going on. Uh, we can look, look then at one way of eliminating one of the round trips, which is TLS session resumption, uh, which is uh, effective for repeat users. And then we look at TLS false start, which is a way we can eliminate another round trip, if possible, uh, for first time users. And then we'll look at uh, OCSP stapling. Uh, where, with any luck, there's a, there's sometimes there's a third round trip involved, and we can eliminate that one as well, or at least make it very efficient. And then some final um, goodness on the top, uh, HTTP strict transport, transport security, uh, where we can uh, use a server configuration to tell the browser, uh, tell the client directly to use SSL TLS without any need to negotiate um, what's available. And then a brief mention of Cypher Suites towards the end. So the TLS handshake itself, uh, before the client and the server can begin exchanging application data over TLS, the encrypted tunnel has to be negotiated. So the clients and the server have to agree on the version of TLS uh, they're going to use. They've got to choose the Cypher suite and, if necessary, verify the certificates. And of course, each of those steps requires new packet round trips between the client and the server, which adds startup latency to all TLS connections. So in essence, uh, the first step is the client is asking of the server, send me your certificate. And the server is responding, here it is. Thirdly, the client then says, mm, that looks good. I'd like to use this cipher. And the server is then responding, OK, let's go. And then finally, we can do the um, encrypted application data. <coughs> so you can see in that there are, uh, the TLS connections require two full round trips uh, for a full handshake. And of course, there's the CPU uh, resources to verify and commu compute all that uh, for the ensuing session. The good news is we don't have to repeat the full handshake in every case. And that's where we talk about TLS session resumption. With session resumption, if the client has previously communicated with the server, then can, uh, an abbreviated handshake can be used. And that requires just one round trip to allow the client and the server to reduce the CPU overhead um, by using previously negotiated parameters for the session, uh, for the secure session itself, hence TLS session resumption. Uh, by using session identifiers, then you can remove that round trip as well as um, the overhead of public key cryptography, uh, which is used to negotiate the shared secret key. So uh, you can set up a secure connection, uh, establish it very quickly, uh, and have no loss of security because you've already negotiated the security in the previous sessions. Um, in practice, um, most web applications attempt to mul uh, establish multiple connections to the same host to fetch resources in parallel, as you'll know. And by that, so that means that uh, session resumption is a kind of a must-have optimization and to reduce latency and computational costs on both sides. 
Uh, most modern browsers intentionally wait for the first TLS connection to complete before opening new connections to the same server. So subsequent TLS connections can use, uh, reuse the SSL session parameters to avoid that costly handshake. There's two ways of doing it. Now you can use session identifiers, and that's where the shared state is held on the server. The server assigns um, session ID, uh, it will cache the parameters, and the client will respond with a, a session ID, and the session can then be resumed. But that means that the server itself has to store the cache of all of those sessions. And if you've got a, a, um, a site that's handling a lot of users, then that means a large session cache, which may be absolutely reasonable in your use case completely, um, but not necessarily. Uh, and you do have to be, of course, careful about how you expire the sessions and rotate things um, securely. The second way of doing it, which won't, of course, require that massive session cache on the, the server, server end, is to use session tickets, where the shared state is on the client itself. There, the uh, server encrypts parameters. Um, it sets an opaque ticket, and the client sends that opaque ticket back, and the server can decrypt the ticket and then resume the session. Um, so, that, yeah, the shared state is then on the client itself, uh, making things far more efficient. Um, the smart and uh, uh, cryptographically conscious of you will be aware that that potentially opens a security hole, and so tickets need to be, uh, session tickets need to be uh, rotated regularly uh, to make sure that security uh, isn't compromised. In fact, Adam Langley on the Imperial Violet blog says session ticket keys have to be distributed to all front-end machines without being written to any kind of persistent storage and frequently rotated. Uh, that's what this, is, this looks like in practice if you send an OpenSSL request to an um, appropriately configured server. Uh, you'll see the session ID uh, in some of the, re the, um, the response and the session ticket you can see there at the bottom. Okay, so that's great for uh, return users, uh, but it doesn't help um, where the visitor is coming to the server for the first time or if the previous session has expired, and that's where we need uh, TLS false start. TLS false start doesn't change the way the TLS handshake protocol happens, but what it does do is it alters the timing of the, the um, protocol handshake, um, alters the moment at which the application data itself can be sent. It seems to make in kind of intuitive sense that once the client key exchange record is agreed, uh, the, s the server already knows the encryption key and it can begin transmitting the application data. The rest of the handshake is kind of confirming that nobody's tampered with the handshake records. And so that can be done in parallel. Now, as a result, false start, as it's called, allows you to keep the TLS handshake down to one round trip. Uh, regardless of whether performing a full or abbreviated handshake, it can still be, uh, still be used. Uh, in practice, though, um, even though TLS false start is generally backwards compatible uh, with all um, clients and servers, um, enabling by default has been problematic um, to, due mainly to some poorly implemented uh, servers. So as a result, modern browsers um, kind of get around it uh, or um, have to check that it's in place. Oh, actually, I think I've got a little graph. Yeah, yeah I'll show you that in a second. Yeah, so uh, to deploy false start um, in Chrome and Firefox, they require uh, NPN to advertise that uh, the protocol is available and also uh, requires that an appropriately secure cipher suite is chosen that in, um, enables um, forward security. Safari just wants that last element. It just wants to have a good cipher suite that supports uh, forward security. Uh, Internet Explorer has a combination of a blacklist of known sites that break when TLS uh, false starts enabled. And it also has a timeout built into it to repeat the handshake if the TLS false start uh, fails. So in practice, what you need to do to implement it is to have NPN and, um, and a good cipher suite uh, in place. Uh, yeah, so that's what this looks like in practice. Uh, so you see on this little graph here, the, the top row is um, uh, standard HTTP 
uh, no SSL involved here at all. And you can see the, the response time there. Uh, the second line is a poorly built um, server doing SSL badly. And essentially, we've got three round trips going on there when we don't need one. Uh, the third row is SSL properly in implemented in Nginx 1.5.7. The MTU record you don't need to worry about too much, but that's about fixing the size of the um, TLS record. Uh, but the, the, the important bit is the final line there, where you can see that we back down to one round trip extra. Um, and by comparing the top row and the bottom row, you can see the only thing which is different is that one round trip. Um, so the overhead of uh, implementing uh, TLS is, is reduced down to as low as it can possibly go with false starts. So in short, just turn on NPN or enable NPN and choose a good cipher suite, and you should be good to go, which means, uh, yeah, good to go. Right, OCSP stapling. So the last element in the uh, stage is, is OCSP, uh, Online Certificate Status Protocol. Uh, and that's a protocol for checking if the SSL certificate itself uh, is still valid or whether it's been revoked. And what happens there is the browser sends a request to an OCSP URL um, to um, find out the status of the certificate and receives a response back containing the validity parameters, which, of course, introduces some significant problems. One is that it's compromised your security because you've already asked a third party um, whether this site is valid or not. And so privacy is being compromised. It could potentially put a heavy load on a CA server, and it also adds, of course, an extra round trip time, none of which you want. Um, so yes, yeah, so a privacy. The OCSP uh, requires a browser to contact the CA to confirm uh, the certificate validity. Uh, CA knows what website's being accessed and who's accessed it. Um, yes, OK, so OCSP stapling then. Uh, is a way of um, trying to cut down on, on all of those three problems. Um, and essentially what happens is that the server itself um, queries the OCSP server um, directly and caches that response. And the response then can be stapled, hence the term, uh, to the TLS uh, SSL handshake. Um, it becomes part of the certificate status request response. And as a result, the CA servers are not burdened with the requests. Um, the privacy issue is, is dealt with. Uh, and bra browser no longer needs to then disclose the user's browsing habits to a third party. Um, but it also means, of course, there's one less DNS, TCP connect, and response in the middle of the process. So put all those together, um, and yeah, you've got a great thing. Uh, do you need to bear in mind, oh, sorry, yes, yeah, so that's what it would look like if you were implementing it in, in Nginx. It's very simple, just a couple of lines in your Nginx configuration. And in the same, uh, same request that we, we showed a, a minute ago, uh, this is what you would see in the middle of that response data. Um, there we go. Do bear in mind, if you're going to implement it, the OCSP stapling does increase your certificate size, so you need to know whether that will be a problem for you. The final element uh, here really is uh, HTTP strict transport security, HSTS. And what this does is it converts the origin server, your server, uh, to an HTTPS only destination. Um, what that does, of course, is it eliminates the unnecessary conversion of HTTP to HTTPS, uh, all those redirects, and it shifts the responsibility for that to the client itself, takes it away from the server and it's back on the client. And the client, uh, the browser, will automatically rewrite all the links to HTTPS. Uh, it does that by uh, instructing the user agent uh, to enforce several rules. Um, all requests to the origin should be sent to HTTPS. Um, all insecure links and client requests should be automatically converted to HTTPS on the client before the request is actually sent. Um, if there's a certificate error, then the error message is thrown to the browser and the, the client isn't allowed to, to view the site. Uh, you can't circumvent the warning. And uh, it can also set a, a maximum age um, cache, uh, um, which you can set to some, some large thing like you know a whole year, 365 days. Um, 
And then just before we finish talking, uh, uh, yes, so this is what you would do in, uh, in your Nginx configuration. You would simply add the header that says use strict transport security. <coughs> and a quick last mention about Cypher Suites before we try and put this all together. Um, so when choosing your Cypher Suites, just make sure that uh, what you're doing is uh, looking towards um, ensuring forward security. So don't use SSL version 2 or 3. Use TLS version 1, 1.1 uh, or 1.2. Uh, concept of forward security is, is quite a simple one, really. The client and the server negotiate a key right then, which never hits the wire and is, is destroyed at the end of the session. Um, so with forward security, if an attacker gets hold of the private key, it will not be able to de de decrypt past communications, hence you're being um, secure forward. Private keys only used to sign the Diffie Hellman handshake, so that doesn't need the uh, pre master key. And um, yeah, do think about backwards compatibility though when you're doing this. Um, there's lots of different ways of implementing your Cypher suite, uh, which can ensure uh, more or less backwards compatibility. Um, for uh, help out there, there is, there's plenty of websites which will tell you uh, good Cypher suites to use. Mozilla uh, keep track of a, a wiki of um, uh, the latest that you need to know for implementing TLS. Um, and they, they offer uh, a really good backwards compatible Cypher suite, but it is huge. And the bottom link there will, will give you something else as an alternative. Um, so, just to summarize the SSL TLS stuff, here's a checklist of what you might want to do to achieve a one round trip time. Implement false start, and that will give you one round trip time for new visitors. Implement session resumption, that will give you one round trip time for returning visitors. And implement OCSP stapling, uh, and then there'll be no OCSP um, process blocking the request. So, we're going to look now at Speedy itself. Okay, so some brief history. Uh, the first documented definition of HTTP was uh, version 0 0.9 in 1994, 1991. Uh, and the, one, where, where, uh, the version 1.1 was being worked on through the mid-90s. Uh, many browsers were HTTP 1.1 compliant before it was agreed as the standard in June of 1999. And the 1.1 is the version that dominates internet traffic today. Um, by the middle of last decade, rich media became such a significant feature of websites that it became clear that HTTP 1.1 was inadequate for the modern web, um, and people started thinking about its successes. In November 2009, Google then published a project they'd been working on aimed at making a two times faster web which they called Speedy. Um, since then, Speedy has been developed substantially as a protocol, and the current version 3.1 is substantially different one from what was originally published. As of July 2012, the group working on Speedy has said that it's working towards standardization, and the first draft of HTTP version 2 is taking Speedy as the basis and working forward from there. In a similar manner to HTTP 1.1, um, whilst HTTP version 2 is being developed, the early versions version that is speedy is being deployed, and most modern browsers now support the speedy protocol, with some notable exceptions that we'll mention in due course. Um, some of the best known users of speedy at the moment are Google, Twitter, Facebook, Max CDN and CloudFront. Uh, there's plenty of others, of course, but that's there's too many to mention, really. Um, Speedy, it it allows the the goal of the Speedy is to reduce web page load time. It achieves this in three primary ways. It allows the client and server to compress the requests and response headers to cut down on bandwidth usage. It adds a session layer 
between HTTP and SSL that supports concurrent interleaved streams over a single TCP connection. Um, it allows the server to actively push resources to the client that it knows that the client will need without waiting for the client to request them. Um, Sp Speedy requires the use of SSL and doesn't support plain TCP. There's some advantages on the server side. Compared to HTTPS, Speedy requests consume less resources, uh, CPU and memory on the server, and compared to HTTP, Speedy consumes less memory but just a bit more CPU. Uh, this may be a good or bad thing, or completely irrelevant to you, uh, depending on which resource your server is limited by. Um, all of these benefits are dependent on the network and website deployment conditions, though. Um, there's browser support. Most good modern browsers support Speedy, but not all of them. Um, for example, Safari doesn't support it at all in the version 7. Um, IE 11 has only partial support and earlier versions don't support Speedy at all. Um, the next version of Safari that's packaged with, packaged with Yosemite will apparently, by all reports, support Speedy. There's bandwidth and round trip time to take into account with as well. Uh, speedy benefits are found to be larger when there's less bandwidth and longer round trip times because uh, the round trip times and bandwidth determine the am amount of time page loads spend in the network relative to computa computation. Uh, Speedy provides minimal impro if improvements under good networking conditions. So the biggest point here would be mobile browsing uh, because mobile networks usually aren't that great and getting the most out of the bandwidth there is a good thing. Um, yeah, multiple origins. Uh, Speedy can multiplex resources from the same origin, but most website requests and responses are spread throughout multiple origins. So we lose a bit of the impact that Speedy has on our, has on our site. Um, browser processing, once the browser rece receives the page resources from a speedy enabled server, it must process them. So a slow browser, well, it, it will limit the gains from speedy traffic. And then there's packet loss. If packet loss is high, speedy may actually hurt the situation. A single connection, as in speedy, uh, will su suffer significantly under high pack packet loss situations uh, because it aggressively reduces the congestion window compared to HTTP. Um, which reduces the congestion window only on one of its parallel connections. Um, however, packet loss occurs more often when concurrent TCP connections are competing with each other, so Speedy's approach of multiplexing on fewer connections may actually help mitigate, mitigate packet loss. And then getting it all together, the Speedy sandwich, Um, and yeah, getting Speedy to work with Nginx is actually as simple as compiling it with the with HTTP Speedy module, and you're done. So having told you all that, finally we get to the thing that we, we said we propose as a way of doing all this. And... Uh, yeah, this is called the Speedy Sandwich. It's not our name, I have to admit. Uh, I heard a first about this idea from this guy, Barney Hanlon, at uh, Drupal Camp London back in March, I think it was. Um, but took it away as an idea. He just he did a hand-waving kind of thing. I took it, we took it away as an idea and worked it up into a, a real server to see what we could actually do with it, whether it was as good as he suggested it was. But the idea with the Speedy Sandwich is this. 
uh, your original uh, request comes in and it passes to a front-end Nginx, which has uh, four tasks. Uh, the first task is what we've been talking about. It does the speedy bit uh, and SSL termination. Um, I don't think actually you mentioned, but speedy has to be an SSL. It's one of the, one of the you did mention that, great, So uh, One of the aspects of speedy has to, has to be an SSL. Uh, the front engine X, because as we said right at the beginning, is brilliant at uh, static file caching. We get the front end to do the static file caching. Um, Nginx can push out static uh, static assets uh, unbelievably fast. Uh, if we give this Nginx access to the dock routes, it can handle those static file caches probably even faster than Varnish could get them out of RAM because it's got access to the file handles themselves. Um, maybe not in the first time, but because it's, sta it's caching them, three, four, five requests to the same image, certainly very, very good. Um, it can also, it should also then do the gzipping on the front end. Um, so there's no need for Varnish itself to handle gzip content. Uh, just let the top layer deal with that. And then um, help the uh, Nginx do the caching with some good page speed implementations. Uh, page speed is user agent aware, so it can make sure that the right version um, of what's being requested is being put out to the right user agent. That then passes on to Varnish, which is the middle of the sandwich, uh, which does what Varnish does best. It caches the dynamic pages, and it does it blindingly fast. And it can do some cookie normalization. Varnish is very good at normalizing the cookies. So, um, so that's, that's a good thing for it to do. And then the final uh, element, or the final bread layer in the sandwich, um, I'm English, so we like our sandwiches, uh, is another layer of Nginx, and that does the, uh, the dynamic pages. So it can talk to the PHP FPM um, at the back, and you might want to do some general page speed optimizations. You may not have to, but you might want to. Things like collapsing white space, very simple elementary things like that. And then push it onto the back to PHP FPM, which is running your Drupal application, which, of course, doesn't have to be PHP. It can be whatever is on the back that Nginx is talking to. Uh, but that's the idea with the speedy sandwich. Uh, so here, just to, uh, to round off, we'll get to what we think looks like the payback. So a few uh, screen captures for you. This is um, a request. Th th these are all requests by the, exactly the same server, but served in a different way. So this is to a... Um, a, a no speedy sandwich, an SSL sandwich, uh, doing exactly the same job, but no speedy on the front. And you can see here, um, we've done all the, the, the stuff we talked about so far um, with uh, TLS optimization. So the SSL connection on the very first row is as small as it can be. But then all the, uh, the other page elements are flowing in um, off, one after each other in a classic kind of waterfall um, uh, uh, way in which they, they come down. Implement speedy, and that changes. So they come almost parallel with each other, completely parallel. You see the almost vertical line there. As soon as the SSL connection has been dealt with, then all of the, the rest of the page assets come in dramatically. That blue line on the right-hand side uh, is the uh, page completed, uh, which on uh, the previous one, sorry, is the right-hand edge of the page, so um, 1.9 seconds, roughly. Uh, oh, no, going the wrong way. And then with Speedy, that comes in dramatically to 1.5 seconds. So we shaved off 20% um, 20, 20 or so. And then implement the speedy sandwich which, with all the goodness that we talked about. And what you end up with is this. And you can see far less assets being passed across and all the speedy goodness. Uh, everything has collapsed down as much as it possibly can be. Page speed is doing a great job of pushing everything together, uh, full on caching from Nginx. And the page, speed, uh, page load time comes down even further. And we're just marginally over a second here on this um, completely uncached browser requesting this. I've done some load tests as well. Uh, it's quite hard to do load tests because C Speedy is such a new protocol. To, um, load testing with it is not easy, but we've done our best. Uh, so uh, uh, a ramp test here, uh, ramping up um, five concurrent users all the way up to 50 concurrent users every 30 seconds. Uh, so you can see there, this is, this is what the, the test looks like when it's being implemented. Um, the number of hits, concurrent, um, simultaneous hits per second, uh, maxing out at, what's that, just over 350, isn't it? So with a no-speedy server, I'm afraid these next couple of um, graphs aren't in the same scale, 
Um, but you can see that um, this highly optimized server, Ollie's bought himself a massive server. He just likes showing off boys with toys. Um, it, the <coughs> SSL or TLS sandwich is very, very fast, but there's quite a, a, bit, a bit of fluctuation in the um, uh, response time, page response time. Implement the speedy sandwich, and it's much, much more consistent. And the uh, average uh, page response time is less than a third of a second. Well, in fact, it's only just more than a quarter of a second there um, on that ramp test. To show this in distributions here, with, without speedy, 95% uh, of requests are taking just over half a second. We implement the speedy sandwich. 95% of requests there are taking, what's that? That's 0.4 of a second. So, you know, we're shaving off 15-20%, uh, which is astounding considering we're doing things on SSL. So just to summarize, uh, we talked about how we think using the, the speedy sandwich can make things, make your sites super fly. Uh, we talked about why we think Nginx is, is such a great tool, our, our go-to tool uh, for very, very fast websites. Uh, why Varnish is, should be implemented because it's a stupidly fast um, reverse proxy cache. Why everything should be in SSL and TLS these days. It's vitally important that it's installed by default um, everywhere. Uh, why Speedy is the, the verge of the next generation of HTTP. Um, and uh, what Google are doing and how, how it's been taken on um, by the HTTP working group. And then finally, uh, a proposition of putting it together in a speedy sandwich. So there we go. We thank you. <laughs> Questions, yeah. Okay, so two, two questions. Uh, first of all, why not skip? There's a microphone there. Does someone mind passing that microphone across? Maybe not on the stand. Oh, sorry. I didn't. I didn't realise it was wired in. Sorry. You just talk really loudly so everyone can hear. Okay. So, uh, first of all, why not skip varnish and use microcaching for NGINX? And the second question is, uh, do we have any progress with uh, changing the current system with the security authorities in SSL? Because if the bad guys compromise them, they have the keys to the kingdom. Are doing a self. Okay, um, I haven't actually looked that much into microcaching. Can I repeat the question? Oh. The first, the first thing was... Uh, uh, the first question was, um, why, not, why not use microcaching instead of Vonish? And to be honest, I'm, I'm actually, I haven't tested microcaching enough to, know, to give any meaningful answer to that. And... Yeah. So, I don't know. It might be better. Um, as for the SSL keys, can you actually repeat the question? Yes. Uh, there is this problem. Uh, if NSA, for example, compromises a security authority, they okay. have the master private key. So, they can, use, they, they can have every private key that So they can decrypt everything. So if you want to protect yourselves from the uh, NSAs of the world and uh, whatever, uh, that's a big problem. True, that is a big problem, but I don't actually see that that be getting fixed anytime soon. <laughs> No, no. Actually, you can you can use um, Nginx as a wildcard ter terminator and just proxy everything to Varnish. No, we're, we're talking TLS. A TLS. Oh yeah. yeah. So uh, SNI enables you to be able to do multiple domains on one IP address. Yeah. And whether or not you know if any of the uh, supposed uh, 
No. That's a good suggestion. That's a good suggestion. Yeah. Actually, I think in our latest uh, test box, where we were actually doing the G tipping um, in Nginx before varnish. So varnish would get the G tipped stuff to serve out. Oh, so you G tip it on the back end? Yeah. Yeah, no, that was, yeah, there's, I think that was the latest version of our test. Any other questions? At the back, yes. Okay, um, how do we detect if a browser supports SPDY. Um, without with a, Yeah, of course. Um, that's because the initial handshake has the NPN uh, alternative protocols in it. So we'll, we're just saying that we're supporting Speedy and we'd prefer you use Speedy. But then if the br browser doesn't understand Speedy, then it'll just fall back and use regular, regular SSL. So basically, with the setup, anyone who can use Speedy will use Speedy. Yes, sir, do you want to stand up and shout? No, if you want to do anything like this on the mainstream, you use Speedy for now. It's HTTP2 isn't, isn't far enough developed, but it's, it's going forward. In that case, thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Yeah. It's just two different uh, but you, you, servers. Uh, 